Good morning. Good morning. I always like pastor say, how are you? And I will say, how are you? <laughs> well, this morning we have a nice weather. And I realized that this morning we have a number of children are sick. Three of them. But thank God, after three weeks, CC and other children recovered and back with us. Before we go to the sermon, let's listen to this introduction. Okay. There's this drama series known as Beautiful Illusions. A Singaporean TV series which aired in 2005, uh, the year that Martin was born. And it star Fan Wong in two diverse roles. On the on my right, okay. On my right, the white this is uh, her name is Yi Xin, as you can see that nice, gentle, and uh, good personality. On the right, it's known as Joe Ann. He used the word wimpy as If you watch the show, she's pretty evil in this, you know. So I seldom watch drama, but when I try to watch this with my wife at that time, sometimes I'm lost. Why? Because sometimes Fan Wong is easy and sometimes she is Zhou En. Who is who? And it turned out that they are the same person in that movie, but two personalities. Okay? Today, we're going to see... Uh, this is a movie, the same person. Huh? Today, we're going to see that two names, but one person, Jiko. And uh, Jiko's name was Chen. Uh, to Israel in Genesis 32 verse 28, last week preached by Jehon. And in the Bible, Jacob is called Jacob twice as much as Israel. And to be exact, from Genesis 33 to Genesis 50, Bible used Jacob 45 times and Israel 23 times. When the patriarch Abraham changed his name from Abraham, Abraham's name was used quite consistently in the Bible. If we have more in new believers reading the book of Genesis, I believe sometimes the name Jacob appears, sometimes Israel. It can be confusing, you know. And for me, honestly, I was confused in the past as well, so I remember this. And you will say that, Alama, who is who? You will sit down and you search too, then you understand, ah, this is the same person. So today we're going to go to chapter 33 and ask, is Jacob still as Jacob or a chained person by the name of Israel? To the whole process of reconciliation with Esau. As for us here, we should examine ourselves at the end of this sermon and ask, am I Jacob or Israel? So this morning, we are going to see Jacob meeting Esau after exile for 20 years. To recall the last few chapters, it's good that we ask this question. How is the past 20 years of Jacob's life? Is it good? Is it wonderful? Or is it hard life? Difficult life? First, we know Jacob are away from the parents with no contact. No parenting love anymore. He was separated from Isaac and Rebecca. You know, in those days, not like today, your daughter can call you from Australia, or even you can write a letter. Nothing in those days. And Bible didn't uh, write much about his mother, and uh, we believe probably Rebecca passed away at that time. If Rebecca did pass away at that time, can you imagine Jacob? He was loved by his mother. No? Not even a chance to see her, right? Second, he was living in fear of Esau because he still had the thought that if Esau is nearby, surely Esau will go after him and kill him. You can see his fear still in his heart before the meeting Esau in his prayer in Genesis chapter 32, which is last week. The Bible says in verse 7, greatly afraid and distressed. Go use the word greatly. How can you say Kiagal outside? Living in fear of someone will not give you a peaceful life, right? So, 20 years of hard work, I will say. He worked 7 years for Rachel, but end up, oh, it's near, another 7 years. Then another 6 years for the flock. 
So in Genesis 31. And the Bible also mentioned it's which change ten times. Well, it changed up, uh, it's a good thing. Uh. But two times it was highlighted, this means his wages change ten times down, down, less and less, less and less. Five is the fifth. He got no possession of my stock until God intervened. Laban, his father in law, already planned. Why? Wow, I'm going to hide all the speckles, spotted, mortar, lamp, sheep away, away from him. Three days isn't away. So he planned that Jacob had nothing but God intervened. And his wife, Rachel and Leah, daughters of Laban, mentioned in Genesis 31, verse 14 to 16. She said, his, their father treat them like foreigners. Consider being sold and devour their money. And Laban even used his own daughter as a pawn to keep Jacob to work for him. So you think this 20 years is a good life or a difficult life for Jacob? In the Bible, in Genesis 31, 4, you say that uh, Jacob himself said that to Laban, God saw my affliction. So, Jacob experienced the deception of what he did to Esau. Now, he got it from his father-in-law. If Jacob didn't collaborate with his mother to scheme in the first place more than 20 years ago, this difficult journey would not be necessary. Probably he will be developed by God through another process and maybe an easier journey. In these 20 years, the only comfort of Jacob has is God is with him. Here you can see God caused Laban's flock to increase abundance through Jacob who was caring for them. Jacob's family grew into a very large clan. Jacob prospered because God blessed him to become a clan leader. Last week, Chihon highlighted Jacob wrestled with God, representative, the angel. And after Jacob was broken down, then he started to turn to God and rely on him. God changed his name to Israel from Jacob, from holder of the hill, supplanter, to the triumphant with God, or we call it who previous God. Was Jacob now a really changed man? Because his name has now changed to Israel? Or Jacob still remain the same old self. We shall look into the passage further to find out more about him. This is also why to the sermon title I put it. Are you Jacob or Israel? Verse 1. Now Jacob at the distance saw Esau coming with 400 men. Why 400 men? Bible didn't really tell us more about this. But it can be possible that Esau coming in such a number in case it's proven necessary if hostility turned out because of the conflict past that he had with Jacob. Now Jacob, a clan leader, he might some men, and uh, although with children, women and rock can be uh, not easy for him. But it also can be possible that Esau have advantage if tension broke out for the men. We do not know exactly, okay? However, Esau said no word. I come in in peace. We are coming home. Nothing. So, it's intimidating, right? Based on the number, it's also a large group, 400 men. Scary, right? Now imagine, you offended a neighbor at the lower floor. Another neighbor run to you. Priscilla, your neighbor coming with 40 men. Wow, you scared, right? Because you got no word about coming. So it's similar. We don't really know clearly what is the purpose of coming with 400 men. But, Clearly, we know God already started doing something in Esau heart. God is going to answer to Jacob's prayer in Genesis 32. There is certain confidence building up in Jacob's heart as he listened to God calling him to return to your country and to your kindred. 
So, he complied and is doing it. As Esau is approaching, when you see Jacob was limping, as the previous chapter, towards him, he might ask himself, what happened to this schemer, my brother? Now he's a limping person. He even bowed down to the ground seven times. Verse 2. Yet Jacob quickly made arrangement of the maidservant and children in front in the most vulnerable position, divided his family, probably just in case God's answer might not be the same as what he thought or might be different from what he interpreted. Why Rachel and Joseph at the back? There isn't a clear reason given here. But we all know from the previous chapter that Jacob favored Rachel since day one. If Esau had chosen to attack as per Jacob, mine back to Genesis, he thought that at least maybe a portion of the family survived. Jacob has no idea from which line the Messiah, which means Jesus, will come from as God promised the father Abraham. Today we know the line that he comes from is not from Joseph, it's from Judah line. So, this whole arrangement is not about protecting the line of the Messiah will come from. But it's more towards Jacob's favoritism of Rachel and Joseph. Why Jacob divides family in spite of God assuring him twice? God assured him in Genesis 28, verse 15, I am with you and will keep you whenever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. And also in the other words, God used and said, I will be with you. But Jacob seems to be in fear. So the question we ask, was Jacob a really changed man? Name is strip or still the old self, Jacob? To say Jacob is a changed man would be exaggerated, right? But to say Jacob not a changed man is also unfair to Jacob. Because with God given new courage, he is stepping forward in front all the way of the procession. He responded to God's call to return. And he is returning and resolved for the face to face with Esau. Reunion, reconciliation. Jacob seems to be partially Israel, partially Jacob. Okay, let's see for verse 3. Bowing himself to the ground seven times. Bowing down is an act of showing respect and honor as the biblical culture custom of that time. Okay? Today, we see that some Japanese also bowing down, like Shoko staying with us. When they come back, they will say, hello, no, no. No, it's kind of Japanese. But not to the level of Jacob all the way on the ground. Okay, on the ground. The number seven represents the total and complete. And seven times was customarily done before kings in those days. Okay? So, in this act, did Jacob demonstrate the portions of full submission and humility? Yes, probably. It is right to treat Esau like a king, bowing to the ground and seven times. Is this a believable way? Do you think God wants him to do so? Well, I think probably not. Why? In spite of him assurance twice, we can see Jacob overly reacted in the previous chapter out of fear instead of relying on faith in God. Yes, Jacob can be humble, showing respect, but not to the extent of his action of giving up his lordship. Do you know by right, by right, Esau is the one who should bow down to Jacob. Moreover, Jacob has God on his side. From the 
uh, responsive reading we had this morning, two uh, set of verses in Genesis 25 27. The first one said that the older shall serve the younger, not the younger serve the older. And also in 27, he said that be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. And God even on his side and said, Curse be everyone who curses you, and blesses be everyone who blesses you. And moreover, the third reason is that the outcome of the whole reconciliation turned out to be friendly, as we can see later in verse 4 and onward. A tender reunion. That means to say, Jacob fear and action of dividing his family is actually not powerful. Jacob is trying to rely fully on God for this coming reunion and reconciliation. But obviously, he is not trusting God fully as per his action in verse 2. Now, relying on God means we love fully and trust to Him whatever the outcome God wants it to be. We are ready to accept it. If you can accept whatever the outcome, then I tell you, your heart will be at peace because you really accept whatever the outcome. God knows the future and we do not. God knows what is the best outcome for both sides. God's sovereign plan is above all. Man's plan is to follow God all the way. Here we learn that Jacob didn't fully entrust the outcome to God. So, is he still a Jacob of Israel? He said that's the Lord of Jacob in the new Israel. If this division 1 to verse 3 is a test on Jacob, whether he is Jacob or Israel, probably Jacob just passed the test. Why? Because he had a lot of courage that he go to the front of the procession. Pause for a moment. Is it the same for many of us today? At times we are like Jacob, at times we are like Israel. We declare we are believer, Christian, but we still have the old self in us and fail to live up the new self as the new creation in Christ. Often, we take things on our own hand out of fear instead of trusting God completely. Now the first principle that we can gain from these three verses is that believer must trust God fully for the outcome of reconciliation. Do you trust God fully or partially? I always remember this question from our late elder Lord. He reminded that partially trust is still distrust. Distrust is sin. And trusting to God the outcome is surely not easy. But it's necessary in developing of our faith. It requires to wait and constantly stay close to the Lord for comfort, guidance. If not, it can be like Jacob, who overly reacted, as you can see in chapter 32, and also now dividing his family out of fear. Brother and sister, trust God fully for the outcome. Second part, from verse 4 to verse 11. Esau meets Jacob. Now, Esau ran to meet Jacob. I think this probably a terrified Jacob, you know, compared to if Esau would walk up slowly to Jacob. You know. Surely Jacob most probably thought his life would be game over because his brother rushing forward to see him. But we thank God, as God already working in Esau's heart. And God only wants to bless Jacob in this reunion and reconciliation. Bible tells us that even the king's heart is under the control of God in Proverbs 21 verse 1. Right? God can turn it whatever He will. 
Esau has opened to his brother. Esau fell on his neck and kissed Jacob. The Bible says both wept. Esau and Jacob did not feel a need to work out the past. What was past was past. God worked in both their hearts and there is no need to open up the old wounds anymore. The kids seem to be an indication of forgiveness together with the heart and followed by both brothers when. The gestures and emotion indicate forgiveness and reconciliation prevails. Two brothers separated by his sin were united to the repentance of one heart and humility. Two nations didn't end up in war. Edomites versus Israelites. Esau saw a change in Jacob. Probably an arrogant and stingy brother, Jacob now became so humble. Verse 5 to verse 18. Then Esau's attention diverted to the rest of the people, and Esau asked, Who are these people with you? Here Jacob pointed to the giver of all blessing, which is God, and mentioned it was all blessing come from God. The agenda of reconciliation now turned to the focus on God. God is to be praised because God is the center of all reconciliation and blessing. Jacob mentioned three times in here. Verse 5, the children whom God had graciously given your servant. Verse 10, talk about favor, which is like seeing the face of God. Verse 11, because God had dealt graciously with me, because I had none. Now, if you're in the reconciliation and feel awkward with another brother or sister or friend, if you don't know what to say further, follow Jacob. Talk about what God has done in your life. Okay? If you count your blessing, I tell you they are many. And therefore, it is right to give glory to God's name. The following acts of the servant, children, Leah, Rachel, and Joseph bowing down in respect to Esau continue to expand the humility of Jacob's family. Reconciliation require grace from everyone. Jacob's arrogance in the past has been displaced by humility now. Even he is a clan leader. Even Esau, a godless man, was touched by what he saw. A humble and leaping Jacob and his family paying respect to him. Verse 9 to 11, the gift. Seeing Esau's face was like seeing the face of God. This show Jacob knew this deliverance from harm from Esau was truly from God and by God alone. God is always ready to forgive us if we repent and sincerely seek forgiveness and reconcile with Him. Then His favor will be on us. Now Jacob found the favor of Esau as Esau forgave him, just like God forgave him. Jacob somehow still could not be 100% certain that he had found favor in Esau, unless the present has been accepted. Okay? And we can see that in that culture and custom of those times, you never accept a gift from an enemy, only from a friend. To accept the gift, it was a sign that you accept the friendship. Giving gift is alright. It's a sign of Jacob that he was truly really sorry. And when Esau accepted the gift, it was Esau ways accepting Jacob and saying he was forgiven. But now, the problem is the pressing method by Jacob. Probably even the last lavishing gift is not right by pushing Esau to accept it persistently. Esau was reluctant and he said, I have enough, verse 9. But again, Jacob is pressing. The Bible used the word, urge him. 
and he's talking, you know what's touching? Please take it. It's alright, have it. You know, just like when you sometimes met those uh, salesmen, uh, they keep pressing you to buy, you know. Of course, now with a new rule, prevent counting. So the word urge is keep asking, keep asking. And we can see also this in our life. Doing something similar by using a generous gift or a lot of gift or to buy the heart and favor of the other parties. Is this right before God? Is it a good testimony as a believer? There's a true incidence, I was told that there's one leader of a church, not our church, is using this method. Instead of give, he used to buy dinner at the restaurant with the reverends and the elders, so that in future any need, he get favor from them. Ultimately, you buy dinner, all this comes down to what? The motive in your heart, why you buy dinner. I'll take in this meal, after some years, something happened, he realized and he told it to me. That's why I come to know him. Now, Jacob learned that in spite of his sinful acts, God desired a good outcome of reconciliation between him and his brother. Evidently, Esau and Jacob live together in peace, of course in different locations. There is no record of further hostility between them. In fact, both brothers laid their father to rest. Isaac was buried by both of them in Genesis 35. What do you see out of this whole process of reconciliation? Is Jacob still Jacob or is he Israel? Did he demonstrate full trust, God, or partial trust, and still act on his own with passive and approach to get what he aimed for? The reconciliation turned out well, yes, tender, emotional reunion, but we must acknowledge that the whole reconciliation process success is not from what Jacob did, it's from God. God worked on Esau's heart, also in Jacob's heart. Brother and sister, I think and I believe all of us here have some kind of broken and strained relationship in our life that needs repair, just like Jacob and also Esau. I don't think anyone here do not have one broken or strained relationship. Whether or not that broken and strained relationship is restored, it depends how we handle the situation. But before we can go to man, we need to go to God. We need to reconcile with God first. Is God telling us anything about our strained relationship with Him before man? Turn to God with your sincere repentance heart. How do we respond to the command of Jesus say that love your enemy? We can find the answer only through our Lord Jesus Christ. We all know that the penalty of sin is death and the broken relationship with God need to be repaired before we can reconcile with man. The only way to reconcile with God is at the cross and through Jesus. The Bible says, in Romans 5, verse 7 and 9. God showed His love. Christ died for us, justified by His blood. Be saved by Him from the wrath of God. And the Corinthian chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that, all this is from God. Right? Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself and gave us the message of reconciliation. Without the closing song, which is the meaning Jesus paid it all, we are all condemned permanently under God's wrath. If God wrath, would visit us this morning, we are finished. None of us can sit here to worship Him. 
We own all to Jesus for a life because He reconciled us with God and removed the wrath of God. There is a price to pay for sin. Jesus paid it all, not partially. Jesus reconciled us with God because He is a Prince of Peace. Because Jesus, we got to know and enjoy God better. You see? Do you know that you can never outrun God's love, mercy and grace? You can never outrun Him. No matter what you have done, brother and sister, God is willing to take you into His arm and love you with a perfect Father's love. You can see what happened to Jacob. Cheated Esau, birthright and blessing. Yet God worked in getting both of them reconciled. All he asks that you humbly come to him, confess and repent over your sin, and commit to him on his terms through faith in Jesus. God wants us to be restored to him far more than you ever want to be restored. That is why God sent his only son. When you do return to him in humble repentance heart, he will be full of joy in welcoming. That is fatherly love. Until you have learned God's love for yourself and be reconciled with God, you will have a difficult time to reconcile with men. If you want reconciliation, we need to be willing to swallow our pride, give up our right, and humble ourselves like Jesus. Also like Jacob, but not giving away his lost sheep before God, for men. If we're going to be the minister of reconciliation, we must be willing to do what Jesus did, what Jacob did. Give up the thinking about what we deserve and our pride. Be willing to sacrifice our pride for the sake of relationship. We have to face the fact that reconciliation takes two sides. One side where it never changed, right? We need God to cause the other person to respond favorably. Nothing based on human strength can heal the broken relationship. Only God can change a human heart as God did it in Esau's heart. May I ask you, and you have to be honest with yourself, is there someone in your life that you need to reconcile? Or someone in this church that we need to reconcile? Or someone from another church that you need to reconcile? Will you ask God and rely on Him for reconciliation outcome? In this division, verse 4 to 11, do you think Jacob passed the test for his action and decision? I think the scoreline for Jacob is not so good because of the method and pushing in giving. But for the reconciliation, we know it was good. God's word. Here we see the game. Jacob is still the old self, Jacob, not an Israel. In fact, Esau was really a gentleman. Uh, in the midweek, I met the pastor, we discussed a bit as we catch up and we talk. We think, wow, Esau, I think he's a real gentleman. We'll tell you why later on, okay? And generous in forgiving. Because before the gift, we see worst of all, Esau forgave. The gift is coming, verse 11. Now, the second, second principle we can learn from here from verse 4 to 11 is that believers must not resort to unholy method, but rely on God to restore any broken relationship. One great lesson for this reunion and reconciliation between Jacob and Esau is to realize that forgiveness is possible. Forgiveness is possible. That people can change, but sometimes it takes a longer time. So we can't rush. Do not resort to unholy method by lavishing gifts and other appeasing approaches. Let the person come to readiness by the word of God. You can see how God worked on the heart of Esau. I see that actually, actually, Jacob do not even need to give, give, you know. 
as we say that he saw it for him before the gift was talked about. Do you know? Reconcile with God daily. Do you do that? Do you know that every Sunday we ask for reconciliation with God for our sin as one community of believer? In our worship order this morning, we have confession, prayer, assurance of forgiveness for individual and corporate. If you reconcile with God, then you can proceed to reconcile with men with His blessing. Pray for the other party that willing to come forward. There's a huge benefit of your consolation. The third part, parting after reconciliation. Of verse 12 and verse 16. After reconciliation, now it's all offered to Jacob to the journey. Jacob rejected the offer, giving the first reason. The pace. He said that all oh, the tender children, you know, the suckling cattle could not keep pace with Esau men who were used to the road. Do you think it's true? Do you think it's true? By right, who is follow who pace? The escort, his name should follow the VIP pace, right? Not the VIP, follow the escort pace. The horseman or cameraman at that time. Uh, two weeks ago, when my wife and me brought Violet to settle her bank, finance, all this kind of thing, we followed Violet's pace. Not Violet follow our pace. So it's a question mark whether this is true or not, you know. Second, a possible reason is that both have different faith. Jacob followed God. He saw his ungodly man in Hebrew mentioned that. Maybe both a brother might not clash, but it can be their wife, their children, their maid servants, and all this. Like the previous few chapters, you see that the people fighting for the wealth. You know? The wealth, this one belongs to you, this one is mine. So it can be, and then lead to the problem again. Possible that uh, Jacob feels he is wise to live apart. Third, his direction. But the key reason claimed that Jacob has no intention to hate to Seir because Seir is not part of Canaan. Okay? And God had instructed Jacob and Abraham to settle at Canaan, the promised land. Verse 18 mentioned, came safely to the city of Shechem. It indicated that even after reconciliation and after all the assurance, Jacob still has some fear and feels safer if he is still a distance away from Esau. That's why verse 18 tells us, came safely to the city of Shechem. I think this is a true reflection of a human weakness. The human need God in everything and all the time. Jacob's response was not edifying as a believer. In fact, it does not reflect the image of a believer who trusts in the Lord. Why? Look at Jacob's decision. Broken promise. Jacob said he was going to meet Esau at Seir in verse 14. But he has no intention of doing so. It's an outward lie. Went to the wrong place. Jacob went to Sukho, then to Shechem. Instead, Jacob should go to battle the place where he should be, where the place he received the vision from God. And third, okay, this is a map. Huh? Can you see that? That may be too small. <laughs> uh, that's an advantage to see in front, you know. My pastor always says, come and sit in front. Then you can see where is your camp and where is battle. So third is a testimony. Esau could be wondering, why my younger brother used to talk about spiritual things when they are together, now we have like an ungodly person. Broken promise. That is not good for our testimony as a believer. Is he now Jacob or is he Israel? In fact, Jacob should not lie to Esau. That would be the best. 
as a believer, we should always generally tell the truth. I need to go to battle because God called me to. But somehow, Jacob didn't even head to battle, but went to Sukho instead. How are we going to answer to Esau? Very messy. Right? Tell the truth, you're also not doing the truth. You're doing the lie. So he is in a very difficult position because his own self. Very messy. Verse 17 to 19. Why he didn't go to battle? Possibility. Possibility. It could be Jacob preferred the large grass of Shukho rather than the battle which is of mountain and maybe more sparse pressure so Jacob feels secure because his cattle could fit on. Bible didn't really tell us why. But we know he's heading to the wrong direction. He's heading to Sukho was a step backward spiritually as well geographically. As one of the commentators wrote. So God had first appeared to Jacob at battle. And it was there that Jacob vowed to someday return to build an altar and give a tithe to God, as Genesis 28 here. When God instructed Jacob to return to Canaan, God identified himself as what? God of battle. 31, Genesis 31. Jacob did not appear to be a man passing through Sukkot. If Jacob was a sojourner, he will be using what? Tent as accommodation, right? But if he is a settler there, then he built a house. In verse 17, he built a house. What Jacob did further, he also made both shelter for his livestock. So, it is clear that Jacob intended to settle down for some time, not heading to battle. And God did not allow him to stay for too long. And God later directed Jacob in Genesis 35 to return to battle, the place where God first appeared to him more than 20 years ago. God told Jacob to build an altar there, not the altar he built there. Verse 20. We see that Jacob will do something again that his father, Isaac, grandfather, Abraham, are known for. This was the very spot where Abraham, about 185 years ago, about that, built the first altar he erected in the Promised Land. In Genesis 12, verse 6 to 7, it is now consecrated new, a new to God. Jacob builds an altar to God Asher camp, which is called El Elohi Israel, the mighty one, the God of Israel, in which he saw his intense belief in the God who had brought him safely to the promised land and reconciled him with Esau, who had been his God. He persevered, he protected. All thus, in those days represent the occasion and a place where a person has a personal encounter with God. Those God, uh, sorry, those Jacob made an altar to God as you can. It was obedient God wanted first, not sacrifice on the altar. What obedient does God want? He should be now at battle not that she can. Alter a battle and no she can. Are we also like Jacob and Israel? Often we are like Jacob because we focus on sacrifice in action than the obedience in our heart. Jacob attempt to follow the Lord but at the same time he was not obeying the Lord completely. Partial obedience it's also disobedient. By calling the author God, the God of Israel, Jacob was acknowledging his gratitude to God for bringing him safely back to the land. By not going to battle, he was catering to his fleshy fear of Esau. Jacob 
you bear bad fruit and waste of time because he is in a place that he shouldn't be. Later, in Shekhan, something very bad happened. To know that, come next Sunday. I think Chi Hong will preach what happened at Shekhan. Okay? However, we can still learn about building the altar from Jacob. His building the altar is to remember and honor God for what had happened, although he missed the destination, which is better. As for our life journey, whatever we go through difficulty in life, do we remember and honor God like Jacob did? Or we take it complacently? Forget about God, or worse, totally didn't even thank God. We may not build a physical order today at the field and all this, you know, but there can be one established in our hearts. It is sad, you know, and often that when God blesses us, sometimes we are so busy enjoying the blessing that we no longer take out time to honor and thank God. God give us technology, money for work, and a home equipment for entertainment. Whatever you are into, end up we are being absorbed into all these things, handphone, TV, and sucking, and God is no longer the top priority. My wife had a story she shared with me, and she told me that one day, one of her friends said that, there's a bleeding from her breast for some time. She was very concerned whether she's having a breast cancer. At that time, my wife also had some difficulty with the mammogram and all this. So she was talking to a friend. Her friend said that, I will be more serious in my faith if God clear me from the breast cancer. Please pray for me. She told my wife. Her husband and children are attending church. After some time, finally, she was clear of breast cancer in spite of bleeding. But she doesn't seem to remember her promise to God now. Even when they met up, she seemed to have forgotten God who delivered her. So are you Jacob or Israel? Do you remember or you forget? In fact, from verse 11 to verse 20, Who is more gentleman? Who scored more point in this reunion and reconciliation? Esau or Jacob? Just quickly run to a quick one. Je uh, Esau, in verse 4, to him pass his pass. Verse 11, don't need any gift, he already forgiven because verse 4 comes first. He even offered Jacob, hey, I accompany you. Then Jacob gave an excuse, he still said, oh, maybe a few more men, you know. Even though Jacob lies to him that he will visit Esau, there is no history record in the Bible that Esau pursuing Jacob for empty promise made. Probably the only not so good about Esau is that I uh, come with 400 men, uh, tell your brother uh, welcoming, uh, not frighten him. No? But for Jacob, wow, yes, he is courageous. You go in the front, uh, in the discussion, we talk about God as a blessing. But he pushed Esau for a gift. He lied to Esau that he will visit Esau. And he turned up at the wrong place. Can you imagine? So that's why when I was at lunch with Pastor and Big B, he said, mm, actually Esau is quite gentleman now. Huh? In this case, uh, compared to Jacob. So, Jacob somehow remained partially Jacob and partially Israel, isn't it? If he is Israel, then he will do what is right by obedience. God. He will be at the right place and build the altar at Bethel, not at Shechem. And the bad things might not happen. Now the third principle that we can pick up from here is that all credit of reconciliation belongs to God. And God desires our obedience and not our sacrifice. Obedience comes first. Okay? We must obey. Otherwise all your sacrifice is meaningless. When trying to achieve reconciliation with someone, we must always recognize the hand of God at work. 
we must never take credit for it. Because it is only the leading of the Holy Spirit that we would even desire a consolation. And to the Holy Spirit working on the other party, that reconciliation will be successful, right? Apart from God, man cannot make it successful. Man cannot make it successful. God can soften a person's heart. As he did in this chapter, it is so hard. Do you honor God when God bless you, deliver you out of difficulty and trouble? Is our heart grateful and thankful? Honor God and give glory to Him for the outcome of reconciliation. God can restore any broken relationship. One of the major lessons of this chapter is that those who have received God's grace must trust in God's promise of protection and guidance. When you seek reconciliation with others, trust God completely for the outcome. Don't try to do something unholy or politics to gain favour. Rely on God's leading and protection. Seek God's favour, not man's favour. The two applications for us to remember, be like Israel. I think that's straightforward, right? Second, something is easy to say, hard to be done. Go. Reconcile with the people that you have caused hurt before. As I said, easy to say, hard to do. But with God, it is possible. My father-in-law has eight siblings, two sisters and six brothers. Many years ago, two brothers come together and with family topics of this come up, have a great tension and fall out and. The other brothers somehow also take side. And now my father in law family, brother, sister are divided. Every child is still here. We have to visit separately. We came to know this and we was asking, what can we do? This passion tell me and my wife. Maybe we have to do something. What can we do? Older generation is very hard to solve. And we are not able to do that. Only God can do that. So our thought is that to this sermon, Christian sister of my father in law is a Christian. So I think it's right to talk to two of them about what God said in this chapter 33. They must take the initial and first step, the willing to be consulted. Then hopefully the non-believer will do that. So we have to submit all this to God as we learn from this chapter. Reconciled relationships have many wonderful benefits. First, give you a clear conscience. You want to sleep in peace? You feel with inner peace if you reconcile. Two, it also brings you good because your faith will grow. I see a both personal and spiritual growth. Third, you will serve the advance to the gospel world because you and be a living testimony. Reconcile, be a good testimony with the believer and the non-believer. But don't force reconciliation until God moves you. Because God may want to work on you first. Are you Jacob or Israel? Let's come to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. Your words, like a mirror, as we look at it, it reflect on our life. Your word reminds us the way we walk might not be pleasing to you. Your word also shows us that we as believers, that we must reconcile. As you demonstrate in Genesis 33, how you bring two brothers divided and now come together. Pray, Lord, that you help us in the whole day as we continue to rest, rest in you. Help us to reflect and ask the question that, am I Jacob or Israel? Is there anyone that I heard I need to reconcile? Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us.
help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.